Hi, I'm Park Stevenson, Executive Director of the USS Kidd Veterans Museum, and this is... I'm Tim Nesmith, Ship Superintendent and Education Outreach Coordinator, and we're going to take you on a quick and dirty tour through our Veterans Museum and through the USS Kidd. The USS Kidd is fortunate in that it has a museum building ashore. This building was dedicated in 1983 to Louisiana veterans and tells their story. It also tells the story of the kid and the meaning behind her nickname, the Pirate of the Pacific. But most importantly, it provides room to house archival records and exhibits relating to the kid, allowing the ship itself to remain in her 1945 wartime configuration. The USS Kidd was named after Rear Admiral Isaac C. Kidd, who was the Battleship Division I commander aboard USS Arizona, lost his life during the Pearl Harbor attack when the USS Arizona was blown up by a Japanese bomb. The Navy decided to honor Admiral Kidd's memory by naming one of the new Fletcher-class destroyers after him. The new USS Kidd would be built at the Federal Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company in Kearney, New Jersey, and she would be launched in February 28th of 1943. Admiral Kidd's widow, Inez Kidd, would christen the ship on that date uh, as she slid down the ways into the water and then sent over to New York Harbor for additional refitting. The crew would take over the ship on April 23rd, 1943, in a ceremony that essentially brought life to the vessel. A surprising number of people come here thinking that the USS Kidd was actually named after an infamous pirate captain, Captain William Kidd. In this exhibit, we're going to challenge what people think they know and try to teach them something new. For instance, we're going to make the argument here that Captain Kidd not only was not a pirate, but he was actually a legal privateer working under the King's Commission to go hunt pirates. But then, as a lot of people in history are wont to do, he got in the way of some powerful men who used their influence to paint him as a notorious pirate and have him hung and supposedly lost to history. But the manner of which Captain Kidd would be charged with the crime, hung, and buried his treasure would create a myth that would far outlast the man. Here you'll see a fictitious portrayal of Captain Kidd. Uh, the skull and crossbones flag. He's standing there with his arms akimbo, laughing as he attacks an English ship. There is nothing in this painting that is historically accurate. And we'll try to tell you that and try and teach you the difference. That will lead into a discussion about what is the difference between the pirates that we think we know, that we're used to seeing in books and film, and actual pirates. And you might find out that the pirates of reality are not exactly what you think they are. But sometimes that doesn't matter because these fictional pirates, as they become ensconced in their culture, first in novels like Treasure Island, which is loosely based on the story of Captain William Kidd, into a score of movies that were popular in the 1930s and 40s that portrayed pirates as brave, swashbuckling characters. And it was that kind of image that inspired the crew of the new USS Kidd to want to adopt that personality, wanted to adopt a pirate image. And they, uh, as soon as the ship was launched, they would create a pirate flag to fly from this ship on our way to Brooklyn Navy Yard for outfitting. Was this disrespectful to the Navy? Was this disrespectful to the memory of Admiral Isaac Kidd, the Admiral killed at Pearl Harbor for whom the ship is actually named? Well, according to the Admiral's widow, Mrs. Inez Kidd, absolutely not. 
she appreciated the fighting spirit and the daring do that this crew was adopting as part of their pirate personality. And she felt that that was something that these young boys would need in the battles that lay ahead in this coming war. So she went to the Navy Department and petitioned for the Navy to officially authorize the USS Kidd to fly the pirate flag and paint a pirate on her stack, which as the war went, wound on would become a good luck symbol for the crew of the Kidd and a unifying symbol. So we get into a display of artifacts from the DD-661 USS Kidd. And these are actual pirate-related artifacts from the ship that we have in the archives. She would pass that legacy down to her two younger namesakes, the USS Kidd, which was a guided missile destroyer with a whole number of 993. She would have that same good luck pirate symbol painted on her Mac combination stack and mast. And even yet further to her replacement, the DDG-100, the USS Kidd that is serving in the Navy today. And this ship has completely embraced that pirate personality and the crew today still consider themselves pirates of the Pacific. The Louisiana Memorial Plaza is a somber place. It's where the name of all Louisianians who gave their lives for this country are displayed for the public to look at, learn about, and to reflect. The USS Kidd displaces 3,040 tons she is 376 feet in length and 39 feet in beam. She has both defensive and offensive capability. She has five 5 inch 38 caliber guns, five 40 millimeter guns, both in twin and quad mounts, and six 20 millimeter guns. She has six K guns for anti submarine capabilities, as well as two depth charge tracks on the fantail of the ship. Kid also has one quintuple torpedo tube mount for ship-to-ship -ship action. When the ship was brought to Baton Rouge in 1982, she was still largely in her 1964, basically Cold War configuration. A lot of work had to go into changing the ship back to 1945. In addition to sourcing the weapons and other details from her wartime service, there still had to be large portions of the ship that had to be physically manufactured, fabricated out of sheet steel in order to return her to her original configuration. Nate Bergeron is the shipboard maintenance technician for the USS Kidd, one of about two and a half equivalent heads that are used today to maintain this warship. Where the ship during her service was daily maintained by over 300 crew members, today there's only a few, and Nate is the driving force between that preservation effort. He has fabricated much of the ship to return her to her World War II configuration, and through Nate's efforts, the ship now looks like she did almost 80 years ago. So we're here on the fantail of the USS Kidd, the stern. And when we first got her after the Cold War service uh, in 1982, she was bare back here. You had your five inch gun, uh, you had the vents, you had the hatch uh, going down to the crew spaces, and you had one depth charge track over on the starboard side. Everything else had been cleared out. So it was a wide open space, good for parties, but uh, not good for demonstrating a World War II destroyer. So we had to go out through the fleet, uh, the reserve fleet, and find pieces and parts, but some of it just wasn't there. And a blind letter to the navies that inherited Fletcher's after World War II uh, 
was sent out, circulated, and it actually had some surprising results. Let's take a look. So these Orlikans, 20 millimeters, came to us from the Royal Netherlands Navy. And how this all works is you have a gunner who operates the gun, turns it, elevates it, fires the trigger. He lines up through two crosshairs uh, and then leads his target. Uh, on the ones at midships, we actually have the sights that you would have had later on in the war, technology progressing, getting upgrades, and it does the, calculates the lead time for you and also has filters for different times of daylight, dawn, dusk, noonday. Uh, you've got two guys that stand to either side and they will reload the magazines, which are kept in the lockers that you have in between both guns. The white stripe tells you which side of the gun that the magazine needs to go on so that you don't waste time running back and forth from side to side in the heat of battle with a plane traveling 300 miles toward you. And you have one last guy with big asbestos mitts and he will swap out the barrels when they start glowing red hot from, from rapid use. And he'll drop these hot barrels into the diagonal cooling tubes. Uh, on the back of the gun tub, and then he'll grab two new barrels from the spare barrel tubes, slide them in, and tighten them down. And a really good gun crew that practices enough, they can get their time down to about 10 seconds to swap out the barrels and swap out the ammo on the magazines. So these are the depth charges that we acquired from Turkey. These came to us filled with concrete. And apparently what had happened after they became obsolete, the Turkish Navy gave them over to another department of the government. They took out all the explosives, put concrete into them, and used them as lane dividers uh, for the streets in Istanbul. And they had ropes and chains, you know, strung out between them and everything. And if you look closely at some of these, like this one right here, you can see that there's dents in them. So uh, who knows? Maybe they got hit by some of those wild Turkish cabbies that you see in movies and everything. This was the only uh, depth charge track that was on KID when we got her in 82. This is original to the ship. And everything else, if you can imagine the fantail, was gone, except for the vents and the scuttle going down to aft steering. The ready ammunition racks, lockers for the 20 millimeters were brought back on salvage trips from the reserve fleet. And then Nathan Bergeron took and using the original track here and plans from Fletcher class destroyers, he fabricated the spare racks here in the center and the port side rack from scratch. And you can see he did a really, really good job. You have two types of controls for the depth charge track. Up on the bridge, you have a remote uh, launching system, and it's basically it's two handles uh, that you swing over and back into place, and the hydraulics uh, kick in, and they roll one charge off every time you move the handle. Down here, if that remote system is not working, you've got a local handle, and you simply rotate the system, and your depth charge rolls right off the back end of the ship. So when Kid came to Baton Rouge, like we said earlier, uh, she was completely bare bones. All the World War II equipment had largely been stripped off of her as the, as the Cold War progressed. The K-guns were all gone. Uh, Anti-submarine warfare had changed quite a bit, so these were obsolete. We found these on old ships and with the Naval Historical Heritage Command and got six of them and brought them back. The depth charge tracks for the K-guns and the arbors were all gone. The arbors, like ship's equipment, uh, we brought back uh, from other ships, but the racks, Nathan Bergeron fabricated these based off of plans and photographs. And as elsewhere on the ship, you'll see he just did fabulous work. The impulse charge locker where they stored the charges to fire the depth charges off the sides of the ship. These were brought back from old ships sitting in the reserve fleet. And then the impulse charge replicas we have were actually given to us, left behind by the motion picture Greyhound when they filmed on board in 2018. Uh, just some little nice addition that they were able to leave for us. So let's see how this stuff operates. 
for your K-guns once sonar has acquired contact on a submarine they're going to tell you how deep that submarine is and then you're going to open up your K-gun take your impulse charge not a replica a real one you're going to slide it down into the breech and seal it up from there the bridge has controls where they can just simply push a button and they can fire there's six buttons but they can fire all six k guns at the same time one two three four five six when they fire it an electrical impulse goes through this wiring to the firing pin and it'll set the firing pin off now in the event of battle damage which can occur or just bad maintenance if that fails then you have a backup your lanyard when they throw that trigger, then the impulse charge detonates and it contains the force of the explosion in the bell of the K-gun here. And the weakest point, which is basically where the arbor is sitting in the barrel, now the pressure pushes up that weak point, shoves the arbor and the depth charge off the side of the ship. Minimum distance 60 yards, maximum 120 yards. So 60 yards would be equivalent to the smooth sloped surface at the bottom of the levee and 120 yards based on what Google Earth tells me would be where the jet airplane is sitting over on the other side. So these are kids 21 inch quintuple torpedo tubes and these were a battleship's worst nightmare if these ever got into the water. Uh, this would what kid would fight the larger capital ships with uh, more often than her main battery five inch guns. Uh, you had five torpedoes. They're fired off from this torpedo mount uh, with black powder charges, similar to the impulse charges for the depth charges, only obviously much larger. Each torpedo weighs two tons. And the most common question we get from visitors is how do they fire these off the ship? Do they lower them into the water? What have you? And the answer is this whole mount pivots to one side or the other just like the five inch guns, just like every other gun on the ship, it pivots. The impulse charge at the back of the tubes actually will shove the torpedo, the fish out of the tubes and off the side of the ship. It looks in the videos like it's barely gonna clear it, but it clears it every time and off they go. The shield back behind me, the blast shield, covers the two guys that sit on the benches and do the movement uh, locally. And again, there are torpedo directors on the bridge. Everything has a backup. If those directors go down, then these two guys sit here and they hand crank this gun mount around and set uh, the distances and all the settings for the torpedoes and fire them off. The shield is there so that it will protect them from the blast of Mount 53, the five inch gun directly behind it. And at that point, uh, they're basically sitting in a big kettle drum with somebody banging on it. I'm not sure how that helps them any better, but it does. The shield was gone. Uh, these torpedo tubes were gone when we got kid in 83, 82. And these came back uh, from the USS Caperton, another Fletcher class destroyer. The blast shield was fabricated for us in 2019 and installed courtesy of a lot of very nice folks in Phoenix, Arizona. We're at the starboard breakwater of the USS Kidd, right here behind me. And this is the location of where the Japanese kamikaze hit USS Kidd on April 11th, 1945, off of Okinawa. On that date, Kidd, Black Bullard, Chauncey, all of them Fletcher class destroyers, uh, were patrolling 90 miles east, east of Okinawa uh, at their radar picket station. And they had been attacked three times that day, dawn, mid-morning, and at noon. And it's now 1.55 in the afternoon. And they see a plane come in from the northwest, crossing across the front of the formation uh, to attack USS Bullard. And Chauncey takes it under fire, shoots it down. At the same time this is going on, two planes appear east of USS Black, which is on the rear of the formation, along with Kidd on the eastern side. And these two planes are dogfighting. They can't tell which one is American and which one is 
uh, is Japanese or an allied uh, plane versus Japanese. But uh, they held their fire with the five inch guns. The planes got fairly close to the ships. One of them dove down toward the front of the black attacking. The other curved off to the side like he's clearing a field of fire. And they took the first one under fire, obviously, since he's coming right at the ship. And it turned out that that was a trick. The two planes were actually both Japanese pretending to fight so that they could get close within that 10 mile range that the five inch guns could take them under fire. The first one gets shot down. The second one is coming in at the fantail of the black. They take him under fire. He's burning in the wing, but he gets through. He should have hit the black, but at the last moment, he leapfrogs up and over the ship and comes down on the other side, placing himself between black and between kid. Black turns her guns from the port side, opens fire as he's leaving. Kid opens fire with the smaller caliber guns uh, as he's approaching. They didn't use the five inch because they were afraid of missing each other and or missing the planes and hitting each other and doing some serious damage. The smaller anti-aircraft batteries lit him up on both wings now. He's burning on both wings, but he gets through. Kid had only 10 seconds to react, so no, no time for maneuvering. And he hits the starboard side of the ship right beneath my feet in the forward fire room. Now, Fletcher class destroyers only have three-eighths of an inch thick steel on the average uh, on the sides of the ship, no armor belts. And so he punched right through that thin skin into the forward fire room ruptured one of the main feed lines to the boiler. All that superheated steam gets out, kills all those men in that compartment, and the bomb breaks loose, had a delayed fuse, breaks loose, punches all the way through and out the other side of the ship, which actually saved the ship. If it had contained it, it would have cracked her open, she would have sunk. Bomb comes out the other side. The guys were trained to, if you weren't on a gun, handing ammunition or firing a gun in a 20 millimeters open fire, get to cover because by that point in the war, the 20s weren't going to stop uh, the newer planes. And they ran to the far side of the ship to get the deck house between them and what they thought would be an explosion on the starboard side. And instead they ran right into the explosion. So we're in the aft fire room of the USS Kidd. There are two fire rooms and two engine rooms uh, aboard ship, and that's for redundancy. And it really came in handy given the fact of what we experienced with our kamikaze attack, where a Japanese kamikaze actually struck and took out our forward fire room. The redundancy of having two engine rooms, two fire rooms helped. One fire room fed both engine rooms, and Kidd kept going. Uh, this is a space that very few people get to see uh, when they're coming to tour the kid because of the straight ladders that lead down from the main deck. Uh, there's no entryways uh, lengthwise uh, below decks uh, because of compartmentalization. Uh, you, if you had just open doorways, even with watertight hatches, uh, the possibility exists in case of damage that those doorways wouldn't be able to close and you'd have an ice tray effect going from compartment to compartment. Uh, so these spaces are isolated from one another. You can only enter from the top. I'm standing in between two of our Babcock Wilcox boilers. They produce steam for the steam turbines in our engine rooms and they operate at 800 degrees, 650 PSI, pounds per square inch, uh, shooting the steam into the aft engine room. And it would be on the average about 120 to 150 degrees, according to some of our uh, crew members who worked in here. This room has been partially restored to the efforts of our field day program and specifically one of our former crew members, Mr. Richard Ammon. And he served in this space from 1959 to 1964. So we're in the forward engine room for the USS Kidd. Directly in front of us is the forward fire room, directly behind us, aft fire room. Uh, so they're lined up one, two, three, four. And this is where you're going to have the main propulsion uh, for the starboard shaft 
uh, for the propellers. And we take feed from the forward fire room. When the kamikaze hit the forward fire room in 1945 and took that out, then this room lost power, lost steam feed. And Chief Taylor was able to keep his men focused and organized and uh, get everything switched over to where they could take feed from the aft fire room. Uh, so that fire room was feeding both engine rooms and get the starboard propeller up and running again. And the forward half of the ship lit up again with electricity. Uh, so features of this room, this compartment, include the throttle board here beside me, which is basically the control station for the entire engine room. Uh, you can control flow of steam uh, and the rotation of the propeller, uh, shifting it into forward or into aft. And you've got the main turbine and the secondary turbine. You've also got the reduction gears, uh, which basically take the high rotation coming out of the turbines and slow it down and connect it to the propeller shaft so that you don't put too much torque on that propeller shaft running half the length of the ship. You've also got the deaerating tank for purifying uh, the water after it's cooled down in the condenser and sending it back to the boiler. And you've got the AC and DC generators, you, which generate the electricity for the forward half of the ship. You've got the electrical boards, distribution boards for the forward half of the ship. And lastly, down in the very bottom of the space, you've got the condenser. And so this is a closed loop system. The boiler heats the water up into steam. It comes through all these pipes that you see here around me and goes into the turbines. And then from the turbines goes down into the condenser. And the farther it gets away from the boilers, the more it's cooling down, but it's still steam. It goes through the pipes, through the condenser, which opens up through sea chest and sea trunks into the uh, ocean. Cold ocean water fills this big cavernous condenser, but the two never mix. Just the pipes are going through it and the cold seawater touching the pipes cools that steam down, condenses it back in the water, into the deaerating tank it goes, and then from there back into the boiler system. So a completely recycled system. So this is one of the more interesting items aboard USS Kid. This is my good buddy, the ice cream machine. He'd be a better buddy if he actually made ice cream still. There's a couple of different stories about how Kid got her ice cream machine. And when you start looking at these stories, it's very possible both of them are true. One of our former directors informed us that uh, she had been told the ice cream machine came to the crew as a result of uh, a women's club purchasing an ice cream machine for the ship and donating it to the ship. Uh, a story I heard from uh, some of the crew members, the World War II crew members, was that they were fitting the ship out in Brooklyn shipyard in 1943, and they all passed the hat around, pooled their money, and purchased the ice cream machine. And at this point, the officers were still living on shore. Only the enlisted guys were living aboard. They had it delivered after the officers uh, had gone ashore for the day, and they quickly realized after they uncrated it that this was much too large to go down through the hatches, uh, down the ladder wells. And so they pulled their money again, collected a little cash, went over to uh, one of the shipyard workers, the yard birds as they called them, and said, hey buddy, uh, you got a cutting and a welding rig? Come over to the kid. We've got a job for you after your shift. He comes over, they've got a perfectly rectangular spot marked out on the outer hull. He cuts open a brand new ship, peels the skin off of it, slides the ice cream machine in, and then he seals it back up, welds it back up, takes his money, heads home for the night, and then the kid crew takes their grinders and they grind all the weld marks off of that spot and put on a new coat of paint. And nobody would be the wiser, but uh, Commander Roby, our first commanding officer, walks up and sees a fresh paint, perfectly rectangular patch of paint on the side, looks at the ship, sees where it's at, comes down and starts laughing because they didn't factor in the fact that destroyers weren't supposed to have ice cream machines. 
so they don't have ice cream mix in their supply list when they get resupplied. So they had an ice cream machine that was totally useless, but it fits into their whole pirate motif that they had for being the pirate of the Pacific and the name kid. And so when they would pass mail to other ships that did have ice cream machines, they would actually hold the mail ransom between the ships on the pulleys uh, during the unrep. And then the guys on the other ships would have to give them their ice cream mix in order to get their mail. Our overnight program is one of our most popular. Kids from across the south and even as far away as Toronto will come to spend the night aboard the ship and get an in-depth tour of the inner workings of the ship. Very, very thin. It's more accurate, more aerodynamic. It's going to go straight or further. All that good stuff. Oh, yeah. All right, everybody. Uh, feel bad for the people who are claustrophobic. The benches on the hatch are on stairs. Not the blue chair, that belongs. Uh, they would put their elbow in here to eat, uh, just eat with their other hand, um, so that way it doesn't force fly into their face or into someone else causing a fight. Are you on? I'm not really. I love how like, almost everyone here. It's just, just, just like a swing set. That's oh. swing set. All right. So I'm slowly let it down. That's the weight of the gun. Now, if you look by your feet, those are the pegs to push off, so you can move the gun from side to side. It's really hard. This experience is so popular that we'll have adults returning and telling us that they're coming back to visit the kid because they have such fond memories of being aboard as a kid and spending the night. Before I go, I want to direct your attention once again to the USS Kid Veterans Museum YouTube channel where you'll see this plus a series of podcasts on this 80th anniversary year of the surviving Fletcher class destroyers. Please tune in to learn about the history of these ships and the class in general.